I mean, there's so much misinformation out there. You don't see the full story. It's starting to become the image of bureaucratic inefficiency at great expense. I needed to experience what other people had told me. No, we, we don't violate the law. I can't be emotional. It is an interest of all Americans, so we have a responsibility. I did not care for the way tax dollars are being spent. Hello, everybody, and thank you for listening to our panel. I'm a little disappointed that I'm not able to rock my stilettos like I did in August, but here we are, quarantined. My project is pretty controversial. If you haven't heard about the conundrum of wild horses and burros on the rangelands, you are not alone. For being as polarized an issue as it is, no one outside of that world knows a lot about it. So here is what you need to know. All right, so you guessed it. We have wild horses and wild donkeys that roam the United States, or burros. That's what the wild donkeys are. And though on the North American continent we had horse-like species, they were the size of chickens, and they disappeared a long time ago. So these that we know of today came over to America with the Spanish conquistadors. So technically they're an invasive species, but they aren't like kudzu or pythons. These are cute and cuddly and majestic and romanticized. They are mascots of the American West, especially the wild horse. And in 1971, after some serious advocacy, they were protected under the law by Congress because they are living symbols of early American history. The BLM set an appropriate management level, or AML, carrying capacity, basically, of the horses and burros that can roam freely on the range before rangelands start becoming degraded. Is that a word? It's a number that protects the health of the animals as well. And side note, the appropriate management level isn't exactly backed by science. They set the carrying capacity number for all 10 western states that have wild horses to 27,000 roughly. The number last year was an estimated 88,000, with some estimates being as high as 100,000 horses and burros. And here's where the controversy really takes off. The BLM rounds up the horses and burros via bait trapping and also helicopter which you saw at the beginning of this presentation. That's a video I took outside of Price, Utah in October. And believe it or not, burros are in pretty high demand, so they get adopted pretty easily. But a lot of horses that are older or kind of troublesome, they will go to these permanent holding facilities or pastures that are in places like the Midwest. And most of the budget for the wild horse and burrow program underneath the BLM goes to feeding these horses and there are upwards of 50,000 of them. Those are tax dollars. Those are my tax dollars. Those are your tax dollars. And it's a pretty mind-boggling number considering the economic state we're in as of this moment sitting on our couches. But it's not even really about the money that gets people so emotional. I want you to look at this spectrum. On one side, you have ranchers, and you have wildlife biologists, and you have ecologists that think that the horses should be managed so much more, that think the BLM is doing a very poor job at managing and keeping the horses at an appropriate level, albeit whatever the number should be. Then on the other side of that spectrum, you have wild horse advocacy groups and activists and some that are really, really passionate and absolutely hate the BLM, right? And the BLM is in the middle, okay? And so everybody falls on different parts of the spectrum, but everybody has one thing in common. They think the BLM is not doing a good job. So this is where we come in as MEM graduates and second year MEMers. How in the world do we untangle this mess? My whole goal of this MEM project was to increase awareness. Some good knowledge is the first step to solving anything. The first phase of my project was traveling the West and talking to all of these different stakeholders that vary on that spectrum I showed you. Except I did not go to Idaho. Sorry, Idaho. And it was a selective process. They had to have their boots in the sagebrush, so to speak, not some angry person on Facebook. I collected many different interviews, from BLM officials to birth control darters, to officials at the Navajo Nation, even prisoners that work with the wild horses and donkeys right off of the range to train them for adoption. And thus, a podcast was born. This is the first of its kind. There have been documentaries about this, books about this, but there hasn't been a well-made podcast or at least decently made podcast about wild horses. And burrows, we can't forget the burrows. I downloaded Adobe Audition and sat alone in my kitchen 
and made a podcast series. I did all the storyboarding, the music, the levels, the splicing, everything. It was really hard at first. I cried a lot. If any of you are familiar with Parks and Recreation, you know that episode when Ben gets fired from his job and he's depressed and he sits there all day making a claymation video and then he's so excited to show it off. This is what it's like to make a podcast at first. Did you pause it? No, I, hang on. Oh my God, that's the whole thing. When I started my first episode, I sat for four hours staring at this screen just to look up and have only three minutes and 30 seconds done. There were also some challenges I had to overcome, which I think is valuable for second year MEMers listening to this. First, I had to remind myself that this podcast isn't gonna be like NPR or Radio Lab, where there are teams of people working on one podcast. I am alone in my kitchen. Second, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. One of the scariest parts was when both my mentor and my community sponsor left Gunnison in the same month. I also thought I would start production in October and I didn't start production until January and didn't have the first draft of my first episode ready until March. But something you'll find with MEM projects is even though everything can go wrong, will go wrong, also everything that can go right, will go right. And that was true for this project. I had so many unexpected roads open up due to this project. Also, I fell in love with everybody I interviewed, no matter what their position was, because they all had a really good point. The big question is, what do I think now? After all of this, after doing all of this, what is my view on wild horses and burrows? You wanna know what it is? I have no idea. That's what makes this subject so enticing for every different facet that it covers. I want to make decisions that serve the land. I want to be a good land steward. I also want to be a good steward to animals, whether that be wildlife or wild horses. Maybe if we start with this problem, we can tackle other things that seem impossible to solve as well, like climate change, for example. This issue represents something much bigger than what it is. It represents a change. Something has to change. We have these animals on the rangelands. Now what do we do about it? It's not a question of should we have these animals out there or not. It's a question of now that we do, what do we do about it? And it's an open conversation. What does it mean to be human in 2020 with unsurmountable power to change and change things for the better? The small podcast series will be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast will be published within the month and if you guys are interested, I can send out a mass email when it's ready. At the end of this presentation, in just a second, I will play some of an episode. I hope you like what you hear, and I hope you listen when it's out. I'll be ready to answer any questions live on Zoom in just a minute. And here we go. I visited my friend Ashlyn on a ranch she shares with her wife, Barb. And I was surrounded by a pack of weird animals, which included a deaf cattle dog puppy, a pet lamb named Mr. Knees, and an androgynous one-eyed chicken named Leggies. But the star of this cattle ranch was Delilah, an adopted wild horse. On this final episode of Wildish, Mustang of the American West, I wanted to know what life could look like for a wild horse after the holding facility. What a good life could look like. A wild horse or burrow story doesn't end when it's gathered off the range. In fact, it has the capability of changing people's lives for the better. You know, it's almost like a whole different species. Been obviously around domestic horses forever. I love them and they're great and they're special. They're just as special. But something when you look into her eyes and the way her mannerisms, she's proud. When we loaded her in the trailer, I was like, my jaw dropped. This is the most beautiful horse I've ever seen in my life. Anybody would pay big bucks to have a horse that looked like that. And even my wife says, since you've gotten this horse, you've gotten extremely more patient. Like your whole demeanor has changed. She has taught me way more than I've taught her. Something about horses, I mean, it like gets in your soul and there's something about them that's so different than any other animal. 
I mean, I love all animals, but horses have something really special. <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna taste through the microphone there. She's a little mouthy. <laughs>